then I think so the the point here is that if anyone has questions or things that they want then they would ask right so you are the leader uh, in this case and maybe you can also not only just questions but also if you want to comment about things things that you have learned um that you, you think is worth sharing you can also do Yeah, for those of you who are just coming, I mean, maybe I should type it so that everyone can see it. But yeah, let's start the Q&A. If you have any questions or anything that you want to share or you want to explain it and then you want us to, you know, provide feedback, you can. not So whoever wants to start and as you draw, raise the hand. And we know now there's a one minute delay between what we say and then reactions, so we can wait. In a sense, like, yeah, we've started. Hilary? Okay, so my... Um, yeah, my first question is on, on drug gas evaluation. Uh, so we, by default, I think it's using GPT 3.5, but I, if, if I, uh, since I'm, I've done several, I've done like two, two evaluations and I'm, I'm seeing that there's a lot of uh, token usage. Uh, so if we use, if I shift to four, I mean, a lot of usage, so I don't know if that is accounted for because um, I have to test different strategies, and that means I have to test, I have to generate, in my case, I have to generate every answer for every question that is in the evaluation, which is 10. And then on the other part, the ragas uh, will, they, they have their own prompts uh, for, for the evaluation, so they also use those ones to again contact the GPT-4. Uh, so if there are any there is any like improvement I can I can do or modifications to reduce that or if that is okay you can also uh, yeah. can also mention that. No, I mean I think that's a good question and um, just my the first thing that if I were to do it I would be when i am experimenting testing my code understanding i would not use all um i would be much more conscious of just only using one question but once i have a feeling that it's good then i will do you know i will then so it's just much more of thinking of breaking it into your development so if you are developing you know you're not you're not testing the statistics, so you don't need that much number. All, all you need is maybe just, to, you know, like even a smaller, shorter, even not the whole, you know, your retrieved components, they can be shorter, right? And once you are confident on the engineering aspect, and when you want to go to the next level, which is like more to look at the numbers that you get and all that, uh, in, in a serious way. So earlier also, of course, you want to make sure that it's sensible, whatever. But the next level, let's say statistical understanding. In that case, I would gradually increase um, and see. So I would almost always break it into development and you know, kind of more interpretation. So that's how I, I would do it. In that way, you can, yeah, it's like at the final one you wanna, or you know, in the intermediate one where you really wanna see the numbers, uh, once you are confident of the things, I would be it should be fine to do it that way. So it doesn't, and another one to do, of course, again, in the development, you can choose uh, instead of GPT-4.0, if you are not in the development, maybe use uh, GPT-3.5, which is an order of magnitude cheaper. 
as well. Accuracy wise, it might not be the same, but that would that would give you basically, you know, ten times the token for the same price. You can use ten times the token. Yeah, so uh, that that one helps. I will I will start with one question because actually for most of them, uh, some metrics like correctness is less than zero point three. So I'll start with one improve on that, and I'll proceed. And also I'll, I'm using zero point five. So yeah, that's um, good. yeah, I will, I will switch when I when yeah. my pipeline is good. And also another question I had is the the um. So there's, uh, I would like to automate my Ragas testing, but uh, uh, so for now, okay, like what what is meant by automation? For me, my case, uh, the approach I, I take is I have my pipeline, uh, my rag pipeline good, but I can, for me to test different chunking strategies, let's say, I just pass in, uh, I just I just pass in the function, the different function uh, yeah. in my code. So is that okay, or should I make it such that it has to loop something and uh, just sit and uh, wait for? So I, so maybe maybe I missed while while I was just searching while you are asking. I was searching for mm -hmm. alternative to Raga so that we can also see. But um, uh, so. I, I missed then actually the your main point, the question. So maybe can you repeat it just that the main point only? So when you uh, want to automate, you want to automate the Ragas test, and we were explaining about the yeah. what you yeah, mean by want, automation. Yeah, I want to automate the everything, like uh, the testing of every, um, let's say the different chunking strategies I have. Should I pass the each one? Uh, look at the results. Pass another one, or uh, I, I would say I would say yes. In this case, in this case, I would be very very much. It is good to establish your pipeline, automation pipeline, um, already and test them. But don't rely on when in development. Don't don't automate too much. So in production, the automation would help, and so that means in development only develop the automation. But not use the automation for um, for development. As I said earlier, you're not. This is not just uh, software development. This is machine learning and AI. The main, the critical difference between the two. In one, it's all about code. Here, it's about actually what makes sense, right? Automation hides that. You, if you generate too much data, you will not have time to see it. So it is important to, you know, to not actually big fall become victim of your own uh, skill so a lot of people just think like automation you know don't that that is in development automation kills because you will not be able to see and understand what actually goes on so i would be much more like yes in development develop automation so in all of your code make sure that it is you know uh, along the line that it can be automated over time as you prove it, but check first everything. And when you are zooming in in development, it is it just switch the hat, like the between software development and a machine learning or data scientist or data engineer. And the roles are divided in such a way that normally data scientists are bad um, software developers for a good reason. You know, because if they were software developers, they would worry more about the code and the pipeline and the part, but then they would miss the most important part, the numbers, their meaning, you know, what it's the inference. So it's it's a trade-off. It can't so I think a, a very simple answer is that I would be in your development more of uh, take the hat of like writing your code such that it is amenable to automation later but just don't automate it now that's that's does that make sense yeah yeah what i meant is and also like is uh, that um yeah in, in development let's say um 
okay i can look at it like but when i'm testing let's say different strategies or different yeah. methods like that can i uh like um yeah. so can it's I a read up out, right so when you're one, saying like yeah, you have many variables that yeah that yeah can i run them one at a time or uh you know i, have I mean to copy the script to do that let's say in one go you could do it but then make sure to look at each result and think and reflect about it. So if you do that, then it's fine. So the, the best practice is to write up, you know, yes, you know, to use it for like, to develop a tool, if you can, of course, to be able to see the results in a good way. I think, I don't know, today or tomorrow, like for example, um, uh, Stasify will give a, a presentation and some of the, the parts is that when you do experimentation, if you have a tool that you can see things, you know, you can browse and change and flip, whatever, then it, it helps. So maybe just using Streamly type of things or like wh why we use ML flow, for example, is for the same reason. And you can use some frameworks that if you do multiple tests and Ragas may have also already built in, like, or you can use uh, noise and, you know, weights and bias or others where you have actually a dashboard to see all of your tests and reflect. If you can do that, it's easy. So then you're out you have a tool to help you actually then. If you have developed, you know, if you have explored multiple parameters, it will help you systematically explore them. So for all your tests, use some framework that helps you, you know, that it accelerates you. Yeah, okay, great. Anyone else? Japes, yeah. Okay, uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, similar from the previous question, but uh, when we are, I'm trying to change different things on the, like different strategies, maybe chunking, chunk, chunking strategy or multi-query and something like that. And I was trying to test that my change on using Ragas. But uh, I was so I was developing different uh, rag pipelines based on the, these strategies. But it seems uh, unstructured or uh, uh, a lot uh, because we, I, I'm going to have a lot of different rag pipelines. Is there a better way to do this, or should I just uh, try to change a little bit and see if the result is a better one or something? And I'm trying to find to find. Uh, or to relate those rag, ragas uh, evaluation results, and I'm trying to uh, compare them. Yeah. yeah. Um, is that yeah? Is that a yeah, better way? To I mean, you know, like in these things, like I always can answer just only what would I do? Because the the better way you have to research, and you know, there isn't one way. When you do some experimentation and research, it's a lot more about, you know, learning, right? You, they, but what I would do is again, um, first I would really understand, like I have, I make sure that I have a kind of an understanding of what each metric are and maybe read a little bit more if I don't understand them. You know, I think yesterday, uh, some one of the person asked actually, maybe it was, uh, um michael uh what like okay you have done that you know what should what metric should we see um you know to optimize in a way i would be more focused about like thinking about the metrics and what they mean and so there is a lot you can do with just without even experimenting like you know by just understanding the metrics and by knowing what actually the goal is the business goal is a q and a and you know you can solve many of the issues without even running an experiment just by by having a, a clear understanding and when you have when you are not sh when you have some you know doubts that you know this probably is good to test then you just test it right so in part that's experience driven one so when you don't know much you usually test everything and as you build intuition, you try, you only be, you know, you basically run experiments with a good hypothesis. So 
what I am saying in a very simple way is that generate hypothesis first before you test anything. What are, why are you testing? Before you run something, generate just like, okay, you know, I am testing this because I believe, you know, I have a null hypothesis and I have an alternative hypothesis, you know, or something like that. If you can, most people don't do it because sometimes when you are experienced, you do it on the fly, that hypothesis. So that means you go through, in your mind, you go through multiple things and you already kind of discarded and discriminated some things and you already have, you know, you have seen it here and there, it's not probably a good hypothesis. And therefore you taste some of them only that matters or that, that you think is in a good spot. So you do explore in your mind without experimentation, sometimes by experience. So I probably haven't answered your question. I would say generate some form of hypothesis, get used to that, you know, before you test anything, do you know why you are testing? Do you know that, is that, are you sure that the two meters, the two things that you are testing needs to be tested? You know, that means you, you, you already don't have data that validates, um, you know, that one is better than the other. You know, so for just for the sake of it, maybe just you remove, so that way you reduce the number of tests and you become economical as well as also you build intuition. So let me stop there. Have I, has it, ad, was that along the line that, of your question? Yes, yes, pink. Good. Yeah, so a lot more of it is about, you know, I mean, I would really say two things. When you are, because you probably, most of you were trained as a software developer, and it's very harder to shift to a way of thinking in data science because the two, as I said, are much more of like a trade-off. And there's a good reason why people really distinguish and you know they stick with their principle. And sometimes there is an overlap, a good practice, you know, that you can use from software development also in research. But sometimes research has its own way of dealing with it. And just like maybe you haven't traded, but a lot more of research is developed by hypothesis. That means you, you actually, your first principles are not automations and stuff. Your first principles are ideas and discriminations in your ideas. That means like you, you become, I mean, that's I, last time I gave the talk, a Bayesian, you become Bayesian, say like, okay, you know, I, I will give you another, one um, very you, you shouldn't uh, spend much time because this is most people would spend a lot of time and it is interesting but think of it in the weekend you will solve it and if you already the brain teaser if you know it then it's fine but even if you know it the implication is very significant there are certain balls each of them are identical in everything or coins for that matter just think of them just coins identical but there's only one coin that is slightly different by weight. You don't know if it is light or heavy, but you know it's one is different. There are certain coins in every other thing, they are identical, right? So now you have a beam balance. That means you can only measure, you can't see the number. It's not the digital, it's a beam balance. You would have, all you have is three measurement. After that, that's all you are given. You have a beam balance, you have only three times you can measure. And you have to distinguish that one ident you know, one coin that is different. So that's a brain teaser. Think of it, and maybe I will share also, and somebody can share that one. I think there is probably the certain coins. Um, I will share just that I probably will share, or I will ask uh, Nathaniel to share just this brain teaser in Slack so you, you would remember it. But the most important part for me on this one is about discrimination. So this brain teaser, to solve it, you really have to think about in a Bayesian sense. What information do you have and are you using it? Okay, so you have to use almost from information theory perspective, you have to use all information available to solve this problem. If you miss one, you, it's, it's gonna, you will not solve it. So, why I'm why it's related to me is that a lot more of data science and that research 
a lot more of it involves certain form of discriminatory thinking. That means to have two ideas, you know, comparative ideas, altered hypotheses, and then based on some research or based on some, you know, your previous experience and data and, you know, based on data-driven part, you kind of discriminate. And when you can't discriminate, then you taste it and then you, you then use that one later. If you build that away, you are now really data-driven, right? On the software development side, the best practice are, of course, when you do this, to automate them, to do it well, to have frameworks that helps you to monitor them, you know, many things. So sometimes we're these two hats. Um, when you are doing research, kind of think of it in that research term, in terms of ideas and things, not in terms of course and quality of course and things like that. And when you are building as a pipeline, in that case, as a software developer, then yeah, use the software development frameworks and you know best practices. So yeah, okay. Any other question? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay, maybe one question on uh, the retri retrieval part in the LLM side. So, uh, what I understand is that we the the code will retrieve uh, based on the user query from the vector database. That's uh, and get the the document from the uh, vector database. Then it then the I think the LLM is uh will play a part to use the retrieved document uh to answer based on its uh based on its uh the user query and the retrieved documents so wh what i was trying to understand is that if we have a good uh, uh retrieve maybe how we how we can check it's a good retrieval because it will depend on the answer from the llm will depend on the retrieve the good retrieve document and also and based on the model and also we said that if we use multi query it will depend on the user questions also so these three things and the llm will gonna give us a better uh, i think a better uh, answer but how do we evaluate maybe a, li a little bit tip on the retrieval part that was yeah, um, so, but it's already ragas would help you that right they have metrics so if you think of it just evaluating just if something is good um if a context is good or not if i ask you now to solve it what do you do so forget rag rag i'm just saying like i have a method that gives me multiple contexts for a certain question and i want to evaluate it if the you know that the context is actually good how would you come up to maybe i will check keywords maybe if the context and the question i have the similar keywords that's one like direct i think mr also said that you can you can use the recall to measure the context relevance of the retriever the retriever on the on regas that's context precision from hillary but just even before even putting i mean these are correct like but even just if you think of it like you know go through it right now like you want to write an algorithm you know one algorithm you said is just keyword but normally keyword match it's very much, you know, it's already semantic matched. So keyword match is, yeah, good, but not really, because, you know, keywords are sometimes good, but not always, right? So what do you think Ragas is doing? Reverse engineer. Guess. And guessing is really good. I mean, the reason why I'm asking you, you guys to just get, you know explain the challenge document first is if you guess something you are more likely to 
not forget it later when you if your guess is correct or not correct you still will not forget it so my uh, i've learned it from different people one way of learning is by guessing you first guess before you do anything so if you have to so you know if you have to understand newton's laws you don't just read about newton's laws but you you assume you are newton and you try to understand what problem could you solve you know it's like okay there's some gravity thing and you try to come up with newton's laws first yourself and then you read to correct so this is back back you know back propagation more or less if you don't really first have even if a wrong prediction you can't back propagate and humans are very similar and if you're just only absorbing some information normally because there wasn't a prediction from your side you can't learn much so one strategy is really to guess even if it's wrong because when you know something it really that 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 difference the way that you spend to, the way that you thought versus the now the updated information gives you a much more lesson so you know so with that guess what ragas could be doing so from uh, totally guessing but I, maybe it's the same as like uh, cosine similarity uh, using the different by getting the different documents that uh, that are retrieved then checking their cosine similarity with the user question that may give uh, context precision is that my network okay can you hear me now yeah okay. yeah no. no i did hear you yeah yeah so context similarity cosine yeah it could be but maybe others can can someone also want to guess or no if they know they can explain Hillary? so ragas for every metric it has there's a formula with that but before you guess the formula you you, you it passes a prompt to the llm and uh, gives them examples of you give them uh, examples of the equation and the if talking about precision gives them example of a high precision and a low precision and tells them to, to calculate that but it, there's a formula and uh ragas use that along with a prompt to to prompt the llm to uh to get the matrix score yeah yeah so yeah that's that's yeah but anyone else want to improve or want to guess you know just in this case for example the hat is algorithm design you're trying to design algorithm or reverse engineer so again you have to read it and i might not be correct but my guess is also gonna be a lot more closer um so if you think of it if i want to evaluate between two different contexts first what i would do is i would generate from that context the number of questions like from a context i would generate questions that it can answer or it can't answer and then i would compare the equations that i am given like or i know that it can be answered to the equations that are given so that is again even there the algorithm is called reverse engineer right so you first generate enough context from that context questions that can be answered and questions that can't be answered so a negative and a positive sum and then you say like if i give you now a question i could really see which where does it fall again using the cosine similarity for example it could be based on questions but by having by generating questions and comparing the generated questions with the past query you will be able to know in which category it falls so now based on if i generated you know i don't know 10 samples and i ordered them like from negative to positive you know where it falls would give me certain number right so that's one strategy one can use and if you go and read ragas's how it actually measures that it is along this line that's why it generates it, it uses prompts because all of everything in in 
basically AI and generative AI. It's about using prompts. And just, you know, all you have is a truly the engine. So I think like yesterday I said it, all you have is just LLA and and vectors uh, in that sense. Like that. So you are gonna use, you're gonna solve everything based on this. So in a car, if you understand car dynamics, almost everything from a car is generated from the engine, right? So the lights, the thing, you know, and all you need is, of course, like the oil to run the engine and the engine, you know, you attach to it many things, whether it's a piston, whether it's a frame or whether it's this, whether it's that, whether, you know, you'd basically be able to use the force of the engine or what a power of the engine or energy of the engine or some heat of the engine to do something. And LLM is, and in that case, the engines, heat, energy, whatever you call it, you can think of it as to be like prompts, right? So these different types of prompts, you write it because that's how, and so in that, it's really the LLMs to use it, but you then develop a strategy, what we call now an algorithm, in such a way that you can do the same thing. And one way to do it, you know, to infer a number is of course to ask the LLM to say, okay, here is my question and here is the context, can it answer, how how much can it answer, um, you know, how much, what is the accuracy that the question is in the context? And so that's one other algorithm, but most of the time these things have their own tendency of like uh, the LLM not being able to, you know, it's it, statistically sometimes it's uh, convoluted. Sometimes they generate more actually, it, you go in a different direction. So one direction is to say, it's like generate for me um, certain equations, positive and, and negative. And then I, I'm gonna now use a second LLM prompt that actually says, or a vector, for example, a vectorization, then I would use just that one to be able to do vector similarity. Right, so then that way it improves, and and some of the formula that uh, Hillary mentioned, you can go and check in Ragas which type of things that it do. But it's along this line. Okay, so I'm not sure. I think we went far away from your case, uh, Japes, maybe, but yes, uh, thank you. Uh, it's uh, it's given me a lot to work on. Okay, good. Any other question? So yeah, overall, it seems to me, you guys are really closer. So that means most of the, I think there was a question from Mahuba. Um, I'm not sure if I'm really pronouncing your name correctly. It's just almost always when I see it, Mahbuba, maybe, um, or yeah, Mahbuba, just, um, yeah, okay, great. So then the question is on the, and the data given are we are using the questions and answer documents to evaluate our right, yes. So the overall evaluation, so the, the question and answers are to help you, the answers are the ground truths, the questions are of course the query, and you will be able to know now, given that you have the ground truths, you, you can pass it to Ragas actually to give you, to evaluate all the RAG. And RAG, RAG has many components, so if you are just end-to-end -end evaluating, that means you are evaluating all the way. But if you are evaluating, if you want to evaluate manually just the retrieval, then you know, the solution and you can go and, and see which context contains that answer from the document and you will be able to then evaluate only the part of like actually did the retriever retrieve that context and that way you can use just only to use the Q&A answer by expanding by giving it actually the context as a second um, you know by adding it by enriching it yourself you'll be able to also measure only the retriever component and if you now have a good measure of the retrieval, then by subtracting from the overall accuracy, you will also be able to measure just on the generation component. So, you know, you will be able to then test either independently or end to end. But if you're just using only, you know, the question and answers, what you are testing is all the way. That means every component of a rag. Hopefully that answers, number one. Okay, and... I think Abu Bakr seems to have then a question. Uh, yes, can you can you uh, repeat the the answer? 
the yeah. testing between retrieval generation. Yeah, so what does it mean retrieval testing? It means whether you are actually extracted the relevant context. So if you now have a ground truth that you know where it belongs, you know the context, right? So what context that it should be answered. Now, you can measure the noise. Noise means how much of your chunk actually in one method is returned. You know, for example, the let's imagine the actual context, the, the key context is, let's say, five, you know, around uh, 10 lines, which contains both the question type as well as the answer type. So it's, let's imagine, uh, 20 tokens contains that. Now, everything outside that probably would give you um, noise, right? So it still helps, but it may be noise. So in, in principle, by just identifying that part manually, it's not given now, so you have to do it actually, but you will be able to know, to measure only the retrieval component, both, you know, whether it is, has a much higher noise, lower noise, you know, accurate, for example, maybe it was it biased because similar number is somewhere else and that is the one that retrieved. So based on that, you would be able to measure just one component, which means in this case, the retriever. And if you have now the retriever actually fixed, that means you know you have a good retriever. And then once you measure the overall, you know if your error is quite a lot, you know it, the contribution from the retriever is small, so a lot more is in the generation. So you will be able to attribute the error from the overall um, by by doing some, again, it's a Bayesian statistics. You know. If you have error one, error two, and you know, then you can do some mathematics, even if you don't, but at least for interpretation, it will help you. Yeah, go on, Abu Bakr. Okay, so uh, from, from what I understand, uh, we, we just is there a systematic is a systematic way of uh, like testing the retrieval? And, uh, it seems I mean, like we are doing it manually. I mean, you, you you can you can do vector like you can basically search yeah. in this case you can basically search a keyword search because you know a ground truth you can search it where it 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 exists and around that you can do something and then you can use LLM just to just give you only like. The context that actually is relevant so it's summarization so you can let's say like you go and by just keyword search you find the place and around that um, you just do summarization to get that means summarization not transforming anything but just only removing you know the llm can remove anything that's not relevant for that question and that will will give you just you know, that's a systematic way. Again, many things that I'm I'm telling you sometimes I'm just right there I'm coming up so you have to improve them. So it's not that I know, that, but roughly that that should give you something. So so like uh, are we? For example, in in the in the if we implement the keyword one, so are we going to like? Uh, so you know the ground truth, right? The similar so this. No, you have a ground truth. Usually, the ground truth is means unless it's uh, unless it's refreshed, you can find it in the in the keyword. So, for example, for the numbers and stuff. If not, it may not work for all that are refreshed, but that is not refreshed. So normally, if there is citation, I think I don't know if they cite in the Q and A. If there is citation, you would be able to use it. So you, or manually, you can go and cite it where it is actually. And then, so the keyword is to do citation. And that means to find the place in the document. Okay. If it is refreshed, if it's refreshed, you you, you will you should ignore that part. Because that that won't help you. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay.
I think I have to go in the next two, three minutes. So if there is no burning question and also try, you know, much more. I haven't heard questions um, on uh, agents. And I think next week is also a challenge, a lot more on it, focused on agents. So try to get the hang of it. And, you know, the thinking is the same, you know, whether, as I say, whether it's agents, whether it's this or whether it's that, it is somebody has come up, you know, how to use the engine in a some smart way, you know. So, you know, just like a car, if you think of it, many of the components of a car is just uh, some engineering, some mechanical engineers probably really, somebody came up with a good way, you know, to, to do it, whether it is to wash the window for rain, you know, to kind of, uh, so that it allows you to drive in, in the rain or to use, I don't know, some, some uh, to drive the wheels or to, you know, battery, some, you know, to power something or to heat your room, like to your, the car. All of these are innovations around, some innovations around engine. And LLMs, agents are just another type of innovation around the engine, in this case, the LLM. So it is, the, the essence are similar. There's gonna be one way or another, there's gonna be prompts that are sent from, from whatever to the LLM. And the LLM's answer, and that answer can be different type. One are, some are just free form, some are much more customized, let's say if AI functions, like function types, some are more JSON types as an output, but based on what the LLM allows as an output, then you would use that one and then use that one, for example, then either as a classification or regression or like a free form writing. And then you transform that and, you know, then just becomes agent. But agents are same in part. So if you can think of everything in the, in the currency of prompts and LLMs, then that is, that's kind of more or less you are understanding. Don't make it too complex in your head. In your head, you must understand from first principle what an agent is and you should describe it based on prompts and LLMs, even agents, and just and then some innovation around that. So as long as you have that, then it gets clearer. Yeah, Abu Bakr. Uh, so apologies to take your time, but on the query translation part, so yeah. uh, there are different kinds of query translations. So, uh, we just started with one of them so like is there a justification uh, we should actually be doing uh, based on the tasks given or what what's your take on that i mean yeah i mean in a way it's these are different strategies you know why are you translating you're saying there is no sufficient information the llm is in principle if it was so smart it will do the translation itself. But sometimes it's a correlation, right? English that's written in one way may have multiple meanings. And if I translate them, then I make it explicit for the LLM to be able to know it. So sometimes it is if, you know, think of the audience. If the audience are is smart, you might not need um, translation. But if there are vague things, then you'll be able to use the translation to your advantage. And even the most, the good, uh, the most intelligent form of translation that I know is actually, it's called um, semantic route. I think somewhere also we mentioned. Semantic route, what it uses is a type of translation, but in a much more strategic way. They say, why not I tag my resources? So let's say I have a, a chunk or a document in my vector database, why not I tag it in such a way that that these tags represent that better based on questions people ask. Now, if a person asks, then I would check with which tags it's closer to. So it's actually, you're translating from the question to a tag and from tag, then you are extracting the relevant context and from that, you know, you go. So, and similarly, the parent-child methodology is a form of translation in part. 
So I think translation, if you take it in the general, it is trying to solve that there inherently there is bias in the query. And if I am explicitly expanding it or translating it, I will gain some information. It's from information science, it's about gaining more explicit information. You know, either through tagging or through some uh, translation, transformation. So yes, I think there is an advantage, um, especially on vague questions. It would help you if you had already, again, you know, from Bayesian perspective, again, if you want to think of from Bayesian perspective, it is, do you have information? Is all about it. Translation will not help you if you don't have pre previous information about that, you know, about what in the translation. If the translation is not increasing, if it is increasing noise, it will not help you. But if you have certain information that is that the LLM would not have seen if had it not been because of the translation, then it would help. So that means almost always the question. I know sometimes when I talk, I, I make things complex, but in essence, it's what it is doing. It's trying to get almost always to gain just additional information such that either it corrects the LLM bias or it makes something explicit based on you know information you provide. So that information maybe is the algorithm adds information because algorithms, you know, somehow your thoughts, right? And you you are another type of LLM. And so you add your your information in there and in your algorithm, and that adds to the value. So it's almost always it's called prior in a Bayesian sense. So it's about adding prior uh, to the information that the user is giving. If you don't understand this thing, you you can ignore. But all it all what it's saying is that it's about adding you know solving some things for example one type of translation i mean maybe this is a retrieval i have to go is um you have a you you have a known issue in the in the lla for example the middle bias that means the middle part of a large document is un unseen and in that sense by translating and chunking it smaller and selecting you can solve that one so you see like now you are adding information because you have an information that llms are biased and to address that, you devise an algorithm, and therefore that translation helps you, right? So it is this type of things. So you, you know, a lot of them, a lot of these strategies came to to add some information into, you know, additional information into your system to improve it. So yes, so the overall picture is that yes, translations would help you in the case where they are adding, you know, extra information or prior to to the system. Fantastic. I have to drop, but if you have other questions, I think others are here, uh, but maybe just we can also stop here. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Cheers.